all, let us know who you are in the chat. Welcome to everybody, whether you're from Stroud or further afield. We really appreciate you taking the time and joining us for these sessions. So what will we be talking about today? The uh, subject that's sort of on everybody's minds for one reason or another um, is energy, which has finally come to dominate the national conversation. And although Greens have long been focused on the need to insulate homes and install renewables, some political leaders have decided to use the energy crisis as a way of um, doubling down on fossil fuels and reintroducing some of the archaic practices that were not part of their, uh, you know, that were a campaign promise to not do um, practices like fracking, which is often against public opinion and obviously um, actually not cheaper any more than renewables. So, um, we have three fantastic speakers joining us today, um, each of them bringing a slightly different perspective. And we're going to be looking at some big questions. So what are the root causes of the current energy crisis? What can be done in terms of local solutions, national solutions, and a European perspective on uh, how we tackle this energy crisis together? Um, so we're going to be looking at and debating long-term and short-term solutions on how we manage our own energy and how that looks on a bigger picture scale. So just so everybody knows, if you have any questions, then you're more than welcome to drop them into the chat. We'll have the three speakers uh, do their presentations around 10 minutes each at the beginning, and then we'll move to questions um, after that. We usually ask everyone to uh, stay on mute and also turn off your cameras unless you're a speaker and then please leave your cameras on so we can see your lovely faces and we'll invite everybody else back at the end of the session. Um, but the muting is just to make sure we don't have any background noise for the recording. And if you have any technical issues, then you can get in touch with Stroud District Green Party. Um, they are here to help you. So our first speaker, I'll give a little introduction. So um, welcome for our European perspective. Thanks for joining us today, Rihanna. Um, Rihanna is a policy advisor of, uh, for EU energy transition at the climate energy think tank E3G. She's Brussel based and works on EU policy for a clean energy future and transition away from fossil gas. Previously, the European Greens um, climate campaigner and I would say climate expert because we all used to pick her brain regularly um, for all the things we didn't know and she would happily help um, with any of them and unfortunately um, too much about nuclear nuclear if I'm, if I'm honest um, but she's been focused on communications capacity building and she's got loads of experience from a native country, you can might say, which is America, Washington State. Um, but she's also passionate about energy efficiency, bike lanes, which will make you very popular in Stroud and community driven change. So Rihanna, your 10 or so minutes starts now. And thanks again for joining us. Super. Uh, yeah, thanks for that. Very, very warm welcome. Um, and I'm glad to be here. And it's nice to see some familiar faces uh, also among you, but um, many also that I don't know. So um, yeah, I think so. I thought that I could maybe just give a little bit of uh, the perspective from the EU and kind of what's happening here at the moment. Um, I'm sure that some of it is also obviously in the news there as well, but I'm less familiar with the UK. Um, specific context um yeah so uh, at the moment there's sort of a someone described it as a reign of policy in the eu um with just lots of things happening um in response to the energy crisis um which of course started a little bit earlier uh so already last fall uh we were already seeing high prices but then was you know just very much exacerbated um by Russia's attack on Ukraine in the spring. Um, and so at the EU level, there's sort of two kind of like broad categories, let's say, um, where there's these short-term measures that are um, being discussed right now to kind of get us through this winter and the next. Um, and here are things 
that you might have heard in headlines, um, like a discussion around capping gas prices or having um, EU states jointly procure gas. Um, so these are kind of the, the things that are like the hot topics at the moment. Um, but then we also have, of course, our energy and climate policy, um, some of which was already kind of kicked off in the EU legislative process prior to the energy crisis um, through the European Green Deal. Um, and here, I think the, the main things that are most relevant in this context are the Renewable Energy Directive, um, the Energy Efficiency Directive, and the Energy Performance of Buildings. Um, and these are all already quite far along at, at the moment um, and are kind of in the trilogue space. So this is when the European Commission, that's sort of the, the main governance uh, for the EU, has to negotiate with the European Parliament, uh, which Molly, of course, is very familiar with, and, and then the member states themselves. And so now it's kind of in this phase of trying to come to the final deals. And uh, the aim, of course, is to have those be as ambitious as possible. Um, and we're seeing some some progress, some good things, some not so good things. Um, and maybe we can also come back to that later um, if it's relevant. Um, but I also wanted to just give a couple quick examples of things that are happening in EU member states as well. Uh, so that's something that we're looking at right now, um, mainly through the lens of what policies and what things that member states are doing in this moment will actually reduce gas use not only in this kind of short-term period of this winter, uh, but also in the longer term. Um, we're very likely to see high gas prices just continue uh, for years to come. And so there's the that economic and also social element. Um, and then of course, there's also our climate targets and that we really wanna get away from fossil fuels. Um, so for example, Germany, a big, headline country of course um they've been doing some good things um and that's also partly thanks to the greens in government there i would say it's a fair assessment um so for instance they've reduced the tax burden for decentralized solar so household solar and in commercial or public spaces um and also the administrative burden which is i think also um uh, important. Uh, they've also uh, implemented a ban for new fossil fuel boilers uh, that will start in 2024. So it hasn't quite kicked in yet, but that's already an important signal for the market. And uh, in many EU countries, household heating is the primary gas use. Um, so that's quite like a big chunk, especially for Germany. Um, and then another big example is the 2030 target for 80% share of renewable electricity or renewable energy sources so not just electricity but uh, overall um there is a little bit of the of the caveat that especially in the short term they are also investing in new lng terminals um i think fair to say that those are meant to be transitioned over to hydrogen uh from climate neutral sources by 2043 um but you know there is kind of, we are seeing many countries in their move to diversify short-term sources, potentially also lock themselves in into long-term gas. Uh, so that's also something that I think we can gladly come back to. Um, Poland is another interesting example. They're very coal and very gas intensive, um, but even they have just recently announced a 50% renewable energy target for 2040, which isn't maybe the most ambitious, but that is quite kind of a big deal, um, I think, for Poland and not something that would have otherwise maybe been expected. Um, similar, they also lifted a ban or like it was a de facto ban for onshore wind. Um, so that's also kind of another shift that we might not have otherwise seen. Um, and then the final example, uh, and there's many more that we can go into, but Italy, um, they have this super bonus program, which basically covers 110% of your costs for energy efficiency renovations. And this is unique because it's actually the only program that fully covers the cost of renovation. There's other support schemes, but none of them really go all the way to covering that full cost. Um, the downside is it uh, was 
sort of set very broadly in what counted as an energy efficiency renovation. So there were tons and tons of people that applied for it and it got a bit bogged down in just um, not having enough labor and enough um, um, people to actually do the renovations. And it also became very expensive. So there's some questions about um, how it will be extended. Um, and it does also still include upgrading from like less efficient gas boilers or oil boilers to more efficient gas boilers, which we don't want from a gas demand reduction perspective. Um, and then also, I think maybe interesting for the UK context as well, uh, is that Italy does have a windfall uh, tax as well. So that's a tax on the excess profits that companies are making, energy companies, um, from high gas prices. And they're using that money and reinvesting it back into um, those programs for support. Um, yeah, there's quite a bit of nuance and some things are good and some things are bad. And um, like I said, I think the main risk is that we may find ourselves being locked into new gas infrastructure um, that we actually do not want and maybe do not need uh, if in 10 to 15 years, uh, but do need for the next two to five years. Um, so that's definitely something that I think uh, is a risk. But on the other hand, I think um, there is also a decent amount of uh, movement towards solidarity between EU countries and um, tackling some of these measures in the short term. But maybe I'll leave it there and um, we can come back to that. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much, Brianna, for uh, kicking us off on this very important topic um, that is sort of a front and center at policy level, but also in all of our minds on as we encroach into the winter months. Um, some of the things that you mentioned through there, I think that were really important. I mean, these target or changes that governments are putting forward, but that also allows for the shift in the market. I think that that is, um, rather than trying to implement something straight away as like a, you know, it would actually de-incentivize people to do it because the market doesn't have enough time to change, to catch up with the changes. So I think that that was really important. I mean, loads of what you said within the examples that you gave were government incentives. And I think that when Molly talks in a minute, we're gonna see why that's maybe not the case in the UK, but um, it's great to hear so many examples of good things. I also saw today online that Est the Estonian government today has voted on having 100% renewable power by 2030, and their previous target was 40% by 2025. So I think that some of these smaller countries are actually thinking about you know, what their sustainable energy policies look like and making changes, which is great, especially because this I think they were led by a far right government. So, um, you know, I think some policies are just making sense. But um, I think also some of the risks that you raised, greenwashing, um, possibly, you know, we're seeing that with the windfall tax in the UK, but then also the positives that you mentioned around it pushing us together and solidarity between EU countries is really uh, a wonderful outcome of a horrible situation. So thanks very much for kicking us off and I'm sure that people will have lots of questions uh, by the end. So keep an eye out on the chat, but, um, but we'll also get people to ask the questions shortly. So our next speaker is uh, someone that we know and love, Molly. I don't know if you can put your camera on for us. Um, so for those- I've got my you... camera on, can people see me? Oh, I can now you're talking. Yes, you've come into oh, okay. my screen. Okay, so I'll give you a brief overview in case you're someone who doesn't know Molly. Um, but she's the Green Party's <laughs> external communications <laughs> coordinator. Um, and she speaks for the Green Party of England and Wales on the economy and finance and has expertise on climate finance, climate reparations and the carbon tax. And whether she likes it or not, probably is a Brexit expert as well. <laughs> Um, because of her experience, um, but she was instrumental in producing the proposal for an energy cap launched by the National Party in August, and between 2014 and 2020, she represented the southwest of England and Gibraltar in European Parliament, where one of her very close friends, I believe, has just been 
elected as the co-president of the Greens Epi Group. Um, so lots of fantastic news. So hopefully not too doom and gloom, but thanks Molly, your 10 minutes starts now. You're being so upbeat, Jenny. I'm really enjoying it. <clears throat> Sorry, I, I sound like I've sort of had a 40 a day habit all my life. Whereas we all know here that I only smoke the odd fag and I never buy them myself. So that's really not, that's really not why I'm so croaky. Anyway, it was great to hear from Rihanna. Really, really good. I was so glad when Jenny said you were coming to speak. And it's encouraging to hear all the progress that's made in the EU and particularly about Poland, because, you know, my experience of negotiating was Poland with Poland was that they were really difficult to shift away from coal, never mind gas. And I think the fact that Putin, you know, the, the politics of resisting Putin has now overwhelmed their defense of fossil fuels sounds very encouraging. Well, of course, it's always also a little bit bittersweet to hear, hear what's happening in the EU because we'd never get away with what our government's doing if we were still EU members. And that kind of is the point and the reason for Brexit, that we can just be like these Wild West kind of characters now doing, doing um, well, not us, but our government anyway. So my task here is quite an easy one because all I have to do is explain to you how we developed the proposal we made in August. And, um, you know, then we can definitely discuss changes to it and issues and possibilities and so on. But quickly on why we ended up where we did. <clears throat> there were obviously, it was just getting more and more pressure. If you can remember back to August, um, you know, we had Martin Lewis sort of having hysterical meltdowns on um, breakfast TV every day. And, all the parties had to come forward with a proposal. And the problem was everybody was on holiday. And so it was like, where are our energy experts? Oh no, they're on holiday. So we were sort of rushing around trying to think we're gonna have to do something by Friday. You know, it was becoming more and more urgent. So I have to say that the policy was set in that sort of context. I'm not defensive about the policy, but I'm slightly defensive about the, the process because it would have been nice to have more people around to consult. Um, but, Anyway, you can see what, what you think about what, what we did in the end. I mean, there was just a few of us sort of rattling our brains together and, and hoping we could propose something useful. But I think um, the reason I think it was good is that we actually became a part of this discussion and Peter Walker from The Guardian picked up our proposal and, and ran it as an exclusive because he liked it and he didn't think Labour were going far enough. So he was happy to report our proposal and Adrian and Carla also got some coverage of it. And um, it did take a long time to sort of think through because it was such a huge thing actually intervening in the market in the way we, we have suggested. At the time, it seemed like an enormous thing to do. Of course, now the government's done the crazy wild things they're doing. It doesn't seem so extreme, but at the time it really did. And to propose that as the Green Party was quite challenging. But I have to say that on our way to... Um, Harrogate for conference recently I, I just sort of explained to Martin what this was all about and he was like yeah that makes sense so hopefully you agree we'll see so essentially there's a few key questions you have to ask yourself I mean the first key question is are we going to do this by giving people handouts so they can pay these enormous bills or are we going to intervene in the market and actually fix where the price is now intervening in a market is no small thing and obviously as Greens we're we're much happier to intervene in markets than most parties. But even so, <coughs> actually intervening in the energy market felt like a big ask at the time. And uh, it seemed very unlikely our government would be doing that. But we decided that was the best way, not the handouts route. And so then you have to decide, well, what price do we fix energy prices at? And we, everybody else has said freeze energy prices where they are now. But I don't think that makes any sense because we know that where they are now, people can't afford to pay them. That's why we've had to have the £600. Everybody's been helped with their energy bills from the spring. So um, just fixing them where they are seemed to us not sufficient. So we proposed going back to the price last autumn, which was the point at which people could manage to pay their bills. Now, doing that, once you've made that intervention in the market, it seems to me nationalising the key energy supply companies follows because... They're not now going to be getting enough money to pay. They're selling the energy to you. You're controlling the price at which they're selling the energy, but they're still paying the wholesale prices, which they can't control. Therefore, you have to intervene more strongly in that market than just setting the price. So you've got a choice now of just giving those energy companies as much as they tell you they're paying for their wholesale energy, which is where we are, actually, 
or saying, well, there's going to be so much money flying around and so chaotic. Let's just bring those into public ownership. And that has the additional advantage that you can then manage those companies in a way to minimize energy use, um, you know, increase their involvement in making sure their customers have smart energy and all sorts of additional green benefits. So if you're going to be effectively, because um, it is no longer a competitive market for energy, everybody accepts that. So once you've reached that point of saying, we're going to be a big player in that market and we're going to support the price, you might as well use the power to manage those energy companies and achieve all sorts of benefits as well. And then the third <clears throat> question we were asking was, um, you know, what about the fact that we're now fixing low energy prices? Will that just create the wrong incentive and encourage people to use more energy? So then we proposed what I called a differential price tariff. And there's lots of argument about what we should be calling this. I think we're moving towards what we're going to say is a universal basic energy allowance, which is at a low fixed price. But once you use more than that, the price of each extra unit increases rapidly. So it encourages you to minimize your energy use. There's an exception there for, for disabled people or people with chronic health conditions who need to use a lot of energy. But you know we've got to balance providing people with basic energy needs <coughs> at a low price, while at the same time creating some incentive for them to reduce their energy use. And finally, we'd for a while supported the idea of a, what we call the dirty profits tax. So making sure that the, the fossil fuel companies were not benefiting from this totally artificially inflated price and that all that money was brought back into um, the, the public coffers to be used, in fact, for, for insulation measures. And um, obviously the government, um, the SUNAC proposal allows a 90% um, exemption for a fossil fuel companies to reinvest, which is an absolute disaster. It's just encouraging more um, investment in new fossil fuels in the North Sea. So I'm making that sound completely rational and unarguable, I hope. But um, there's two key controversies that this sparked off in the party for reasons that I think are quite clear. The first one <coughs> um, <coughs> is that some Greens were really keen to celebrate high energy prices. And obviously, as the external communications coordinator, I found this quite horrifying. <coughs> but a lot of Greens were genuinely, this is great, energy prices are so high, we're going to have people really turning down their thermostats like we've always wanted them to. And they'll all be wearing woolly hats in bed, you know, and this kind of thing. So to people on the XCOM side, this was like horrifying. It's just the kind of image we wanted to move beyond. Um, but also, of course, you know, it's not, it's not about people who can afford their energy bills or, or can afford some energy, but it's about the people who are going to freeze to death this autumn and winter. And we're, we're absolutely not in a situation where we don't have that still as a realistic possibility. So, you know, our focus has to be on people who genuinely, you know, where it's a life threatening issue, the ability to afford energy, not <coughs> anyway, that was my view. Now's the time when we have to put our social justice above our environmental justice. And the second one, uh, the second criticism that was received said that this proposal was a subsidy for fossil fuels. Now, that just blows my mind. I don't get that at all. We're not subsidizing fossil fuels. We're just fixing the price in the market. It's not even going to go to fossil fuel companies. And if any of the money did go to fossil fuel companies, <coughs> we would tax it back through the windfall tax. So I don't. I don't see any validity in that argument, but other people make that argument and maybe some people will in the question. So that's basically our proposal. I just wanted to close with a few things that we all agree on, which we didn't need to put in our proposal because they're obvious to us, but they're not obvious to everybody. Firstly, demand reduction is incredibly important. I don't know if you covered Rihanna, you know, there's big demand reduction um, programs right across EU countries. Again, our stupid, stupid government is refusing to do this. We had a motion at conference on demand reduction. I thought it was going to be really wild, you know, and sort of like ban all SUVs and 55 mile speed limit and no flying. But it was actually quite mild. But even so, it did reduce energy use by 13 percent, I think, which is really significant. So, you know, demand reduction has got to be the first thing. We, we've always known that we agree about that. And then, of course, massive home insulation. So we don't have to pay energy bills because we don't need to use that energy. And that needs to be where we're going to long term, because you know, even though energy prices will come down, they won't come down um, up to where they were before. And anyway, we don't want people using that energy. So the future is a future of well insulated homes run by heat pumps where you have much lower bills because you just don't need to use very much heat. 
And really the situation we're in now <coughs> is trying to move to, sort of smooth from where we are now with high energy prices, not encourage people to think they're gonna go back to where they were before, but smooth the pathway to higher energy prices forever, higher fossil fuel prices forever, I mean, really, um, but also higher electricity prices, but lower bills because people's homes are well insulated and they don't need to, to use all that energy. That's all. Wonderful. Thanks as always, Molly. And um, thanks for soldiering on with um, the cold that you're dealing with. So, um, I mean, very, you know, thorough and sensible proposal as always. I love the cowboy state introduction. I think that that is exactly what we're dealing with in the UK right now. Um, but yeah, I mean, I wrote so many notes while you were talking I love the term basic universal like universal basic energy tariff I think that normalizing that language and getting people to understand what we mean by universal basic anything is um you know really beneficial in terms of our future vision for the country um all the last sort of key demands that you made um demand reduction home insulation I know that Ellie Jones was recently on the news saying that the the I'm sorry that other people have said it, but like the cheapest energy is the energy that we don't use. And I think that that is really um, powerful, but that only comes from, you know, government provided insulation. We can't be expecting people to pay for these things, but yeah. And also just the concept of social justice, sometimes having to come above environmental justice, I think is something that is really important for us as Greens to put out there because we're often seen as these people who are like save the environment, even if like at whatever cost. And I think that the social justice side of our policy is really never given the, the light that it should do because we have fantastic social policies as well. And, and, and to focus on that is really important. So thank you. And again, I'm sure there's lots of things going on in the chat that I haven't been paying attention to yet, but I'm sure they will come back. So. Um, and, and have a look in the chat, everybody, for any questions that you might have. So our final speaker um, is Maria. Thanks for joining us, Maria, and bringing us a, a local perspective. Um, but Maria moved to Stroud from Spain, where she was living and working for six years, teaching English as a foreign language, uh, and now works as a local coordinator with the Big Solar Co-op. Uh, to encourage non-domestic rooftop owners in Stroud District uh, to adopt solar panels. She's also a councillor on Rodborough Parish Council, a beautiful part of Stroud, um, and is working hard on various sustainability initiatives, as well as making public spaces safer for women and girls, uh, working with campaign groups such as Make Space for Girls and Stroud Women's Refuge. So a really a whole load of causes that are very wonderful. And I'm sure you're going to tell us all about that now, Maria. So thank you. Thanks, Jenny. Yeah, we've kind of um, swapped places, really, haven't we? I think you went to Spain just as I came to Stroud. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so apologies to anyone who's already heard me presenting um, on the Big Solar Co-op and what we do. Um, I'm going to start by talking about who we are, how we started, um, a bit about what we're doing in Stroud and the possible alignment with Green Party values and then how people can get involved. So um, the basics, we're a not-for-profit solar cooperative and we work across the whole of the UK. Um, I don't know if you'll have heard of Share Energy, but it's a renewable co-op um, which has been around for just over a decade. And our origins came from Share Energy, thinking about how these struggling um, local community energy cooperatives could keep going once the government ended feed-in tariffs. Um, <clears throat> they came up with this business model, which I'll go into a bit more detail about, um, that could put um, solar onto rooftops without any kind of government subsidy. So what we do is um, basically put solar arrays onto commercial and community buildings. And then we sell the electricity to the building at a reduced price. 
and um, any surplus goes into future energy projects. Um, so important thing to know is that we're, we're carbon first. So our main concern is with reducing emissions and that goes for every part of the business, not just um, where we get our panels from and how we install them. Um, we're ethical, so I'll go into a bit more detail a bit later about um, the sourcing of our solar panels and professional. So we are registered with the FCA. And I'm, as Jenny said, the local coordinator in Stroud. So this is, um, this, it's new that we're based here, really. Um, and I work in collaboration with Transition Stroud. So it's a new energy co-op model. Um, we are 75% owned by our volunteer members and 25% by um, investor members. Um, and our ethos is to trust our volunteers and support them to deliver solar. Um, and they're supported by a small team of paid staff with, so we provide training tools, peer mentoring, that kind of thing. Um, the way we raise the money for the solar panels is um, with a share offer um, at the moment. So um, we launched our first share offer a couple of months ago. Um, we were aiming to get a minimum of £600,000 to get our first three projects going. And um, we've managed to get that. So we've got the panels ready to install for our first three projects. And um, so we're very happy about that, but we're keeping it going and hoping to get to 1.2 million so that we can, so we've got some money to uh, put into the next few. We've got about 150 in the pipeline. So hopefully we can get some of those going as well. And we aim to give our investors a 4% return. So what kind of sites are viable now? Um, they need to have a large rooftop. This is kind of the business model that we found works without any kind of subsidy and allows us to continue with future projects. So we need um, buildings with large rooftops roughly tennis court sized or bigger. So that's about 300 meters squared. Um, they need high on-site energy usage. So if anyone who's spending about 12,000 pounds a year on their electricity bill or using 60,000 kilowatt hours a year, we, um, and roughly 50% of that needs to be daytime usage. And for the sake of lowering the risk, um, it needs to be a business or uh, you know, community group that's likely to be there in about 30 years time, which is the length of our contract. So the solar host site gets solar with zero capital costs. So we put in the capital, they get um, savings on their electricity bills and carbon savings from the very first year. One really important thing is a hedge against future rises. So our prices go up at the rate of inflation rather than commercial energy prices. Um, obviously increased energy independence is really important at the moment, especially. Um, working with a trustworthy nonprofit partner and being a beacon for future sites. Um, <clears throat> we make our legal agreements as fair and transparent as we possibly can. And so, they're tailored to minimize risks of the host. There's no penalty for repairing your roof, no minimum energy use clause, and um, a really good one for the host site, I think, is that they can buy out from year five without any kind of penalty. So they don't have to stay with us for the full 30 years. Um, so national progress so far, we've designed over 400 sites. Um, we trained 42 volunteers in solar designs, got five training sessions completed. So that means that we've um, got five recorded training sessions which are accessible via our website. And we've got three local nodes launched. So obviously there's me and Stroud. My counterpart um, in Shropshire and Telford is here tonight as well, Kevin. Um, and we've got our first um, installs as I said, the first three ones should be going in by December this year or the first quarter of next year. And we've got about 150 more, more which are, are ready to go. 
So what's happening in Stroud? Well, our aim is by the middle of next year to have 400 kilowatts in progress. Um, I work closely with the local advisory panel, um, which is made up of um, our stakeholders from different parishes around the district. Uh, I'm trying to build up a volunteer base at the moment. I've got three at the moment and um, two of whom are hopefully, this will be really exciting if this happens, are going to solar map uh, Stroud district, which means that we'll be able to see what the solar potential is for all the rooftops in the district, which would be great. Um, and if we're successful with that, we will be the first community group in the UK to have solar mapped their own um, region. So I hope we manage that. Um, working with existing networks, spreading the word. Um, so I've got, I'm going to the um, Gloucestershire Net Zero conference in November to um, exhibit. And we're kind of focusing at the moment on industrial units. We've got lots of community buildings. We want to get some of these big industrial units that have the highest emissions. So how we might align with Green Party values. There are the obvious things that go with um, renewables, decarbonisation of the energy system, energy independence and security of supply. But also, you know, energy that is equally accessible to all um and owned by the community like i said we're 75 percent owned by volunteer members that's actually written into our constitution um we're trying to put solar in places that are less sunny and less wealthy and as i said all our surplus is reinvested into solar um our solar panels the ones that we're using are mayor Berger, which are German and they're the only ones that we have been able to find which are, well, all the others were either clearly unethical in their supply chain or they, um, we couldn't trace the supply chain, which kind of amounts to the same thing, I think. So um, no slave labor has been used in making the solar panels and quite importantly as well, they haven't made the solar panels using coal, which is what they usually do in China. So you've got the embodied carbon already in the panels. So we've avoided that. Um, yeah, government legislation that could change to make things easier for us. Um, so one of the Green Party policies I noticed was having a workforce developed to implement necessary changes in the energy system. Um, we haven't experienced this problem ourselves, but I know there is a problem at the moment with having enough people trained to actually install the panels, um, removing, removing fossil fuel subsidies. Um, I mean, if the subsidies were given to renewables instead we'd have a lot more freedom over which kind of rooftops we can accept which ones work with our business model and um, there needs to be more investment in the grid so we have had situations where um, the grid can't handle the amount of um, energy generated by the solar panels which means that you either have to remove panels from the array um, when you're designing them, or you have to um, block the inverter, I think, to um, make sure that not all of the energy generated goes to the grid because it can't cope. Um, so ways that you can help if you're interested, um, if you know anyone with a big rooftop in Stroud District, please ask them to get in touch. Um, you can invest in our first share offer um, or volunteer. So we've got a big solar gathering on the 19th of November in Shrewsbury, and that's going to specifically focus on volunteers or people who are interested in volunteering and how we can help them. That's it. Thank you for listening. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Maria, for uh, taking us through that. I think one of the most wonderful things about renewables is its possibilities for community ownership. Um, I think, you know, across the board, I remember Rihanna joking with me that you're never going to have 
community owned nuclear power plant. So um, I absolutely agree there. And I think, you know, renewables are the way forward, but so many things that you've mentioned, especially around ethical supply chains, I found that really fascinating. I think that that is one of the issues for a lot of, you know, green uh, businesses that they don't want to just be like the end point is going forward is green, but actually the whole supply chain behind that. So um, really amazing. Also really amazing to hear about the solar potential um, mapping project. That sounds very interesting. I always remember when I was on Stonehouse Town Council, sat in a, in a building that was just down the road from huge industrial estates, like huge industrial buildings that had so much potential for solar and was just not even being thought about when they're building new new factories like right next to the incinerator and it's just so infuriating but um but yeah i think you know there's a lot of uh, energy for this kind of project and stroud is a very good place to um for, for you to be based and starting so i'm sure that lots of people will be interested in what you're doing so thank you to all of our three speakers it's been really interesting um so now what we'll do is I have been just running through the chat as you guys have been talking to try and make notes of, of, of the questions, but we invite our audience to ask the questions if they would like to, and if not, then I can ask it on their behalf. But if I'm right, our first question comes from Jessamine, and it was on Eastern European infrastructure, which I think probably... Um, Basically, if you're a speaker, Molly, if you can put your camera back on and then just give me a hands up or just unmute yourself if you want to go first on these questions. So, Jessamine, if you want to unmute yourself and ask the question, then that would be great. Hello. Um, oh, yes. hi. Great. Uh, I hope you can hear me. And yes, we can hear you. And so, um, as some, I can't remember who it was, I believe it may have been. Rihanna, is that how you pronounce your name? Um, somebody was saying about Eastern Europe and how they very much rely on fossil fuel. And obviously, historically, a lot of those Eastern European countries were former Soviet countries, so they would have been built with the Soviet um, architecture and everything at the time. So if they being so reliant on fossil fuels more so than us I guess if they wanted to change their infrastructure especially with some of those old um like tower blocks flat or flats which sort of are about seven or eight stories high that are crumbling as they are will they have to actually rebuild their whole cities to fit green infrastructure I can chip in quickly on this, and um, Rihanna probably knows more than me, but just to say two things that I do know about Eastern Europe. One thing <laughs> is that um, they have relied, because the state under communism was responsible for keeping people warm, they had district heating systems rather than individual heating in each house. And so the conversion of their energy systems is going to be quite a different project. So if you go to Berlin, <clears throat> you always know when you're going from West Berlin into East Berlin, because you start seeing those huge tubes running along the street and going over the road. You'll see this now, I've told you this, and this tells you you're in East Berlin because they're all still there. <coughs> and they used to pipe heat around the city. <coughs> so even if they're making that heat in a different way, to me, that's still an efficient system. It needs insulation and so on. The crazy thing about Soviet heating was they turned the energy, they turned the heat on at a sort of you know, communistically determined level on the 1st of October and they turned it off on the 1st of April. And, you know, so you'd swelter in their flats. I'm sure lots of us have experienced that. <coughs> That's one thing. The other thing is the surveys show that nobody has worse buildings than us. The UK has the worst buildings in Europe. So <coughs> this is really bad. Uh, um, flats are actually more efficient than houses. <coughs> We've got the worst houses in Europe. I'll have to pass on to Rihanna and have a sweep. Mm -hmm. No worries. Thanks, Molly. Okay, Rihanna, what do you think about that? Yeah, no, um, I think the, the point on district heating is really good. Uh, and that's also something that definitely 
Eastern Europe actually has more. And there you can then actually more easily switch the source of that heating. So at the moment, even though a lot of it, the, the, you know, the heat that is then in that is generated through gas, much of which is Russian, you could theoretically more easily switch that um, that centralized source than it is to go into homes and swap out boilers. Um, so that is one thing that can be um, a benefit. But I also was going to uh, <laughs> make the same point as Molly that it actually the the insulation is pretty bad also in Northern Europe as well. Um, and there then you can kind of think of, um, I mean, and I'm not a building or construction expert, but there are, you know, the really short term, immediate sorts of um, energy efficiency upgrades that you can do, for example, um, like replacing a window, uh, which is like a key um, exit for heat is quicker than doing like a full insulation where you uh, redo the the insulation in the walls, for instance. Um, you can do things like, uh, you know, at the very, very most basic level, um, put foil uh, or like that trans translucent foil in front of the your window and it creates that air cavity that then helps insulate your windows or just replace the aerators on your sinks uh, so that they're more um, water efficient and you're not using as much hot water. So there's kind of like different levels of efficiency and upgrades and um, also as molly was saying like flats are more efficient because you kind of like are heating each other in your apartment building whereas a freestanding house in the countryside uh, is going to get a lot more um cold air on all sides that so it's it there's different kind of dynamics there um and yeah so i i guess that each country has a very unique and their own sort of challenges in the energy efficiency of their buildings and the age of the building stocks. Um, but then you can also divide it into, for example, requirements for all new buildings. So anything that's built now has to meet certain minimum energy performance standards. Um, and then you can have on top of that, another set of policies that looks at how do we um, incentivize or support households to be able to um, upgrade their existing infrastructure let's say so swapping out boilers and electrifying with heat pumps for example um so there's kind of like different pots or different types of policies that you can use um but it also really depends on kind of what the what the system is like if you are district heating and like what kind of housing stock you have um yeah Okay, great, thanks. And I guess that's, you know, the importance of being in the European Union where different countries can get different support from uh, the Union as well, dependent on, on where the starting point is. Okay, so the second question in the chat was from Rich William. Oh, wait, sorry, Jennifer, is this related to the content that we were just talking about? Um, not really, it's Maria I'd like to direct a question at, but in my turn. Okay, all right, I'll come back to you. I'll just go through the chat questions and then I'll come back to you, all right? Thank you very much. Okay, so um, the next question was from Rich Williams and was on best practice. Rich, if you are there and have a comment. Hi, yes. Do, uh... Just looking for the European best uh, system. I was I I went over to Sweden to. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I I went over to Sweden in uh, 2011 2012 before I built my own system, and there's what they implemented was local community setups, where the cost efficiencies then came back to the community, and so they could then put the money back into it, where they funded things like 250 to 350 millimeters of of insulation and airflow systems which allowed better community buildings and more money coming back and to save a huge amount of fuel and resources in the process going further green which was and if we could work along lines like that copying the best practices around europe to come up with the best systems to put in place here while we build a 
a green system to allow us to uh, build local green solar and other renewables, bringing jobs to the community and making the UK be a beacon for Europe as well. Is that okay? I don't know if anyone can hear me. Yeah, no, we can hear you. And it's, yes, perfect. I'm sure um, Rihanna at least, and probably Molly, and I mean, maybe also uh, Maria. Just put your hands up or unmute whoever wants to go. Wait, I can't see Maria. Oh, yeah, Maria, I mean, go on. I can kind of answer that one. Yeah, I mean, apparently, um, uh, I think the people who started Share Energy were actually involved in what was the first community energy project in the UK, which was Bay Wind. And uh, that was actually a group of Swedish people coming over and telling us how to do a community energy project. Um, and that's really, yeah, where all of this stems from. So I think it's great to listen to people from everywhere else and share ideas. Oh, that sounds great. I, I actually, I, I came back from Sweden with those ideas uh, 11 years ago, and they told me to go away. <laughs> so, uh, so yes, I, I was ahead of the game by the sound of it. <laughs> yeah, they weren't ready for you yet. Um, any of the speakers want to comment on this question? Okay, I think there is, um, you know, lots of these community projects that are um, in other countries that are running great, I know there's also a um, there's like a global network of eco villages uh, that also runs and does a lot of these kinds of uh, community based projects as well. Okay, so the next question was from Gary Lulf on universal energy allowance. Gary, if you're there, and also I, I see all the hands, and I will get to you guys. Hi, Molly. Sorry, I'm going to make you talk again when you that's probably the thing that you last want. Um, but how would the um, universal energy allowance work? Would it be for an individual or for a household or some other way? And how might that um, support or conflict other things like, I don't know, we might want more co-housing, for instance, which would encourage people to um, use housing more densely than we currently do? Because there are say in the UK there are more bedrooms than people and yet we have a housing crisis so how might it interact with that sort of thing? I think okay. I can answer this quite briefly because the answer is we're still discussing that and um, so when it came to presenting our proposal we wanted something like this in it and then fortunately none of the journalists were very inquisitive but if they had been Somebody would have had to just wave their arm and, you know, say something a little bit general. But uh, the way I see it is everybody should carry their own right to energy with them, like we say with universal basic income. right? And if you're older, that would be a larger allowance. Um, at the moment, children have a, a smaller allowance for <clears throat> money. Would they want a smaller allowance for energy? Something we could discuss. And then the household will be made up of a number of people who each brought that energy allowance with them. Now, that will be the ideal. Then, of course, we have Tony Firkins, who's the expert on everything green energy. And um, he's tried to actually work out the numbers on this, and it's really quite complicated to do. So the simple way to do this, because the energy companies have details about each household because each household pays a bill and so if if we were going to the simplest way to do something like this would be just to give an allowance per household um, and then the energy company would just do that it would be very straightforward to do that the energy company would then charge them at a higher rate and at the moment people are suggesting not a progressive increase in price but just like the basic rate and then the market rate and I personally um <clears throat> I don't I, I wouldn't support that. But anyway, it's not really for me to say to invent an incredibly complicated system in theory, which then is very difficult to make work in practice or to because Tony's actually also trying to cost this. And so that, again, you know, makes his life a lot more difficult. There is a proposal along these lines from the New Economic Foundation. I don't find it a very good proposal, but it, it shows you how somebody else has thought about this. The problem with their proposal is they give you a chunk of energy for free, both gas and electricity. So everybody who's installed a heat pump like me is now going to be kicking themselves and trying to find ways to sort of flare off that gas. You see what I mean? Um, so it's I, I find that completely incomprehensible. Um, 
So, you know, that kind of tells you it's not an entirely easy question to answer. But I think the principle is quite clear, isn't it? That you do have a right to a certain amount of energy, but if you, 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 you know, at the moment, very rich households are having, we are, we are funding so that very rich households that heat their swimming pools can, can do that at the, you know, at the sort of current energy rate or the, the, um, the sort of energy rate of this spring. And that's outrageous, actually. And that's what the government proposal does, because it doesn't make any attempt to require you to pay more if you use more energy. And I think this is a good principle in general. Like if you're going to fly and produce all those CO2 emissions, you should pay for that as well. Of course, there's also problems with this because then rich people would have private jets and poor people wouldn't be able to fly. But I think there's got to be something about the principle that the more energy you use, the more you pay. Okay. Thanks, yeah, Gary. Great question. Have you got any comments, Marie? I mean, or Oriana? Yeah, that? maybe maybe just to add that Perfect. I think um, because I think that this this concept of like a, a right to energy basically has been, I would say, considered a rather radical approach in the past years. But it seems to me that there is maybe more space to talk about this kind of concept now, particularly when we see so many countries capping gas prices in one way or another or saying like okay we will give direct allowances that are meant to cover your energy bills um which is sort of a way of doing that and in in some cases they are sort of differentiating that on based on consumption so molly like you were saying that if you use um up to a certain amount you, it's covered and then if you go beyond that then you have to pay at the market rate um which i think it makes sense because we do want to keep that incentive to be uh, reducing uh, your use of energy or at least being mindful of it. Um, but I do think that this is like a complicated question and the best way to do it, I think is can be debated and probably also depends on the specific context of the um, country or the energy market in question. Um, but I think that there is more space now to have that conversation and maybe see if uh, and how it could be done. So maybe just to say, now's a good time <laughs> to bring it up. <laughs> Thanks, Rihanna. Uh, and I think like Molly said, you know, there's always gonna be exceptions for like disabled people, or those living with chronic illness. I think that that's the social justice side of the Greens always uh, keeping that in mind. But, um, but yes, definitely time for a discussion on this. Okay, so Mick Donk, who I think has his hand up as well, you had two questions. One was on energy prices, which I think Molly might have covered anyway. And then another one, which was for Maria on leasing. So if you want to unmute yourself and. Yeah, yeah ask uh, thanks. Um, it, well, it, it's, it's more like a gradual um, rise in gas prices, um, obviously, as and when houses are insulated and it's not going to make anyone suffer too much. But again, it's a very complicated thing to do because if it impacts people who are not very well off it will have an effect a lot of people are still on gas boilers and it will uh, how much we can encourage people to to do the insulation and move on to uh, new tech like air salts heat pumps how much we can incentivize that by raising the, the quite cheap um, gas at the moment I don't know but it's something that perhaps needs to be done how we do it is a completely different matter of course and I'd welcome any suggestions but it's is it something the Green Party would consider thanks thanks okay so increase slowly in, gradually increasing gas prices when we're not in a crisis <laughs> when we've well we insulated we homes and we you do. know was it Mick? It's the differential between the two. Electricity yeah, is very Mick, expensive yeah. and gas is cheaper. Yeah, we, we already have that policy because we have a high and increasing um, carbon tax. So our policy, this is one of the things we had to check out at the beginning of this. You know, if we'd introduced that when we started off having that policy, would energy prices actually be higher than they are now? The reality is petrol prices would be higher than they were at least um, at the beginning of the year. Um, but yeah, that, that's our policy. So you establish it like this, you know, this is my favorite graph. You, you establish a line for energy prices that's very clear and rising and everybody gets the message, whether they're um, investing, you know, business investors or, or 
householders, they get the message energy is going to get more and more expensive. And that's why we don't want to let energy prices to go back to where they were. We need to get onto an upward trajectory, fossil fuel prices, I mean. Yeah. You know, we need to get onto that upward trajectory now. And like Rihanna said, now's another good opportunity to do that, to make it clear we've got to drive fossil fuels out of the economy. And again, agreeing with Rihanna, you know, that this has been a monstrous um, war and is an ongoing monstrous abusive situation in Ukraine but Putin has completely changed the discussion around energy and the politics around energy and there are benefits coming out of that. That's brilliant. Do you mind if I ask my other question which was to Maria while I'm on? Yeah sure. Yeah, Actually, yeah, it should be a, a, a relatively quick it's just I've had experience um, I'm, a, I'm a district councillor and I, su I suggested that my council fit solar panels on an industrial building they own However, they came up with a problem that they didn't like the fact that there was a lease agreement, which made it more difficult for them to have panels on what was a very suitable roof. Um, and I don't know if Maria's had problems with the leases that are in place generally with industrial units, because quite often the people in them aren't the owners of that building. Uh, and whether they've encountered problems in that area. Thanks. Thanks, Mick. Maria? um not so far no but um uh i'm just trying to think um well i mean i know we can sign the power purchase agreement with the tenant or the landlord um so that would help i guess um i know that it can be an issue if you've got more than one business in the same building it complicates things from the point of view of them all having their own energy supplier um kevin i don't know if there's anything you want to add there any problems um, in telford <laughs> no well um we get lots of uh, issues like that and 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 we can you know generally work through them that's that's the best thing i can say um, we're as we're carbon first, not for prof for profit. It's you know it's it's in our interest to just work through the problems whatever way we can. Um, commercial organisations might just give up because uh, there's lower hanging fruit somewhere else. But you know we we can work through these, and um, we're incubated by Share Energy, and they've got a history of um, overcoming these uh, problems and getting around these sort of issues so there are it's very complicated sometimes putting solar panels on roofs um uh but generally you can you you can resolve all the issues uh and and put the the panels up but um you've just got to you know know what you're doing and be patient so um the issues are there but we're, we're confident we can overcome most of them this is what i feared because i think avalon energy um in somerset said the same thing he said you just have to find a solicitor who'll deal with it or a lawyer who'll deal with this and sort it out and it sounds to me like my council couldn't just be bothered um, mm. to do it and that's what i feared uh, uh, thanks very much uh, i think that, <laughs> that yeah um i think councils are not, I mean, they need to work more with organisations like Community Energy because they're the they're becoming the experts in doing this, and this is this is what's great about them. I think that's fantastic. Thank you for for presenting. Thanks, Mick, for your question, and um, I'm sure that I think that Maria left a, uh, an email address somewhere on the slide, so maybe we can share that again in the chat so that you can get in touch and maybe they can share some more expertise but um i think that you're right about council thanks maria about councils needing to to lead on this and if we're going to be telling individuals and households to sort out their energy then also councils um need to do uh, their best um at home i know sally's on this call and she was absolutely championing that at, St at stonehouse council when i was there so um Okay, so the next question is from Jennifer. Hand up. Thanks for being patient, Jennifer. Thank you. Um, Maria, can I just ask you a technical and kind of marketing question? Um, I'm not sure I'll be able to answer it, but yeah, sure. <laughs> it's quite simple, really. I've got a little pond fountain, and I've noticed that it keeps going even if the sun doesn't shine at all during that day. It doesn't go to the full two foot height that it does when the sun's overhead and absolutely bright, but it keeps working. So 
is it is it the case now that these aren't really solar panels they're photovoltaic panels and if they are wouldn't it be better marketing so that you don't get these people sneering and saying, oh, well, if the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing, we don't get anything. That's my question. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, yes, I guess that that's true. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we well, kind of say that we like getting people used to hearing photovoltaic, which is more realistic than solar. Yeah, yeah, you're probably right. I mean, we say that we like our rooftops to be facing south, ideally, but because you say, as you say, it doesn't have to be full sunshine for them to work. We can work with um, anything that doesn't face north, basically. So, yeah. 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 Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer, and thanks, Maria. Okay, so I see Jessamine has a hand up still, so if you want to come in. Hi, yeah, so um, basically my question uh, was kind of like, um, so the past couple of years, um, those smart meters have come in uh, to houses where you have, um, like, like my grand got given one, um, and it tells you how much electricity you're using and stuff like that. And then you can also get them to put on your wall plugs and then you can get these um, like smart ones as well, these smart wall plugs where you can do it all from your phone and stuff like that. So, um, so I'm kind of quite fortunate in the sense of I'm still living at home at the moment. So it's um, my family who pay the... Um, electricity and gas bills and I kind of contribute some money when I can so if you're using one of them um, and like what I'm trying to get my head around is that you're not actually paying is it that you're not paying for what you're using you're paying like a fixed rate or something like that um, at cu like currently people are paying a fixed rate, not for what they're using. Okay, thanks, Jasmine. So um, I think this is like fixed rate versus variable rate uh, question. I can't see Molly and... Look, oh, no, I I can, I'm having my smart meter fitted tomorrow. I've waited about six months. I'm quite excited about it, although I'll believe it when I see it. But basically all the smart meter's doing is telling you when you're using energy so you can keep an eye on it and monitor your usage more carefully. Uh, they, the, what, what's not happening very efficiently, it seems to me in this country, is cheaper tariffs at less popular times. Some energy companies are just bringing that in now <clears throat> because of the crisis. So they're gonna charge more. So if you agree to not use electricity between say four and six in the evening, or maybe it's six and eight in the evening, then they'll um, let you, have, you know, charge you a lower rate for the rest of your electricity because that's when they're paying the most to, to buy the electricity in. And similarly, there apparently still is economy seven, although I don't know how you get onto that. But if you, you know, if you put your washing machine on before you go to bed with an eight hour delay on it, um, then it'll come on at seven o'clock in the morning or whatever. And then when you wake up, the washing will be there, but it will have been done on cheap uh, rate electricity. So they, these kind of systems need to be made a lot better because the thing is with renewables, <clears throat> this stupid thing, I mean, how many times we, oh, but sometimes the wind doesn't blow. I feel like punching people when they say that because it's like, yes, you're right. So how are we going to manage our demand to match the way renewables work? I'm sorry, I'm a very peaceful person. I'd never punch anybody, but it is so infuriating, isn't it? Because yeah, it's like, yeah, that's the way renewables work. So we, we've sort of got a, 1950s style coal-based approach to energy and the national grid the national grid's actually moved on they're really good but unfortunately journalists are still back in the 1950s but the reality is we have to learn to use energy when it's plentiful and that means um you know and to do that energy companies should be charging us more when there's not much renewable energy around and everybody wants to use it and um less you know, if we're prepared to do things in the middle of the night or like, you know, for example, oh, there isn't much wind today. Well, I'll do my washing tomorrow then. It's not like such a big deal, is it? But it kind of, we need to move on from the journalists making that facile comment to like, 
yes and so here's what you do to, to deal with that um and yeah i mean that some you know be flexible in your demand for energy really we can do that easily um, you know you don't you know make your bread the day that it's windy that's not difficult is it anyway so that's that's kind of the answer but a smart meter i think enables you to to basically be smart about that i'm sure other people know more about smart meters though, so please do chip in since i haven't even got one yet <laughs> well good luck with tomorrow molly uh rihanna or, or, or maria did you want to come in on that i mean i think molly covered it really well yeah i think this this question about the variability of renewables is like like yes but we can manage it it just requires a little bit more thinking and um planning ahead rather than the kind of this idea of we can do all things at once at any time um and that it is a bit of a it is a behavioral question and also like um expectations question on one hand but on the other hand I also think that the more that we invest in improving this kind of demand side management using smart meters um also things like you know you can have a a smart dishwasher or a smart washing machine uh that knows like okay this is a non-peak time so you put the load in and as Molly said then it runs eight hours later while you're at work or it's asleep or whatever um I mean these are also things that we will be able to improve as we use them and the more we use them uh, the better they'll get and just like with any technology you know you have this like very steep uh, curve of improving over time um and if we invest in that and if we create incentives for that then we can also i think um develop that better amazing thanks so put the robots to work at the time when it's cheapest um okay thank you very much for your question jasmine so uh keeping my eye on the clock we've got two questions hands up i know there's lots of things going on in the chat um I will try and have a look at this while the two questions happen and then we'll see where we get to. So Gary, you're back on. Um, one of the answers to the variability is better integration across Europe. So when it's sunny in Spain, it's not sunny here, that sort of stuff. Um, and that was gonna be really my question. What, what are we seeing in terms of progress on better integration and also about using Europe's resources in the best way? Because it seems quite strange that if you put Belgium and the Netherlands together, they've got more solar capacity than Spain. So is there anything going towards that and also building better interconnections between parts of Europe and the UK? Because we're going to need it probably in the winter. Thanks, Gary. Um, Rihanna, do you want to come in on that first? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm Maybe also I should say, like, I think maybe... I was positive before and I, I am generally positive, but I think this is one question that is an open question uh, where there is sort of this risk that countries will compete for energy sources rather than sharing them. And I think there is also also within sort of our, our, our green narrative, this idea of energy security um, and being able to produce all of our own renewables and being completely independent that is actually a little bit at odds with exactly this um, idea that actually the more that we integrate, um, you know, in, in my case, the EU grids, but ideally also towards the UK or with other countries as well, um, the more we can manage that demand and sort of like uh, help each other, basically. So this is kind of the solidarity component. And I think that is super, um, super important that we don't kind of lose sight of um the importance of having an interconnected grid while we're talking about energy security and the the sort of independence and decentralization that renewables can offer. Um, so I think in terms of what's happening with that and the EU level, um, it's difficult to say, like so much of the focus right now, and also for me is specifically is on gas. So uh, it feels like we haven't quite gotten to the point where there's a more of a discussion um, of how to connect our renewable energy grids. So I think that's something that maybe needs to have um, more of a conversation on. Um, but yeah, maybe just to say that I think that's a really good point um, and it is something that we need to kind of pay attention to. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I guess the energy security point is probably overplayed at 
I'm not too worried that Sweden's going to cut us off or France is going to cut us off. Um, and that slows down European security against individual country security. And I think that's probably a trick that's being missed, really. Thanks, Gary. Thanks for your comments. OK, Lucas. Yeah, good evening. Maria, I've got a question for you. When at Star District Council, I came across a phenomenon that uh, a school had a contract with uh, energy company to supply electricity, but that contract stated that they couldn't put PV on the roof, so they couldn't generate their own electricity. Is that something you've come across? No, no, I haven't come across that. Right. Okay, that's good to know because that's what I got told, and I thought, well, how malevolent is that? So to actually stop people having PV, that otherwise your your electricity price will go up. Yeah, I hope we don't come across that. We're uh, we're happy to work with schools. Okay, great. Thanks, Lucas. Also reminding other speakers if they want to come in at any point, then just uh, unmute or show me your hand. Um, okay, I've seen lots of things going on in the chat. Thanks, Rich Williams, for all the comments and also to Mick. I think the next question is from Martin. I think it's, well, it's put a question mark at the end, but the question mark is preceded by what the fuck? So I'm not <laughs> sure if it's actually a question or not. Martin, are you there? Um, yes, just we've been having a few chats about the standing charge. I just wanted to make the point of how nonsensical it is that the electricity standing charge is higher than the gas standing charge, supposedly for infrastructure, when electricity infrastructure is cheaper than gas. <laughs> so just another incredibly stupid element of the standing charge which shouldn't be there at all it's the most regressive part of the bill we all know the stories of people who are struggling to pay their bills but no matter what they do they can't escape the standing charge clearly it should be paid out of general taxation no question that's it on the why yeah. that they can <laughs> okay thanks for the input i think um I think you've been going back and forth with Molly on that anyway. So um, I think that is all of our questions. Tell me if I'm wrong, anybody, put your hand up. Um, I think that that's all the questions and I really want to thank everybody who's um, put something out there, put something into the chat. We always appreciate you engaging on these really important subjects. So finally, I'm going to go back to our three speakers and I'm going to ask you the question, like, what do you want people to take away from this? If you have like one short message, we've got a few minutes, so you can have one or two minutes. But if you just want to give one sentence, that's fine. Like, what, did, what are they, if they've, if they've not really been listening this whole session and now they're going to listen for these last 10 minutes, what are you going to tell them that they're going to take away? So um, let's go to Molly first, because I can see yeah, I'm going to I'm going to be very brief to save my voice. But I think the most important point is don't celebrate high electricity bills on behalf of the Green Party right now, because that is not winning us any friends. And the other thing which I didn't say at all is that I had a heat pump put in myself in February and my bills are just embarrassingly low. I'm honestly embarrassed about it because I had the money to install that system, right, which I saved for my MEP salary. And it's poor people that need those systems. It's not me that needs that system. Obviously, a lot of insulation as well. But so, you know, we must, I know we are all campaigning for home retrofit, but it's, it's people on low incomes who need to be able to have those low energy bills, not people like me. Thanks, Molly. Okay, Maria, do you want to go next? Sure, yeah. Um, I guess for me, it will just be, please get in touch if you know of a large rooftop in Stroud District or if you'd like to volunteer or invest. Okay, fantastic. If you can just drop all the details in the chat again for the last minute, that would be fantastic as well. Thanks, Maria. Sure. Okay, Rihanna? Um, yeah, I guess I would just say that uh, this is like a, obviously a super challenging situation, but I think that we have the tools 
um, whether it's in the EU or the UK or abroad, that we can actually tackle this problem and we could come out of this situation um, with a, a better energy system than we currently have, uh, a, a more social one and a more climate friendly one. Um, but it's a matter of of kind of using this opportunity and keeping that that pressure on for positive change and not letting us sort of just slide back into the business as usual. Um, I also think Molly's point on sort of this solidarity aspect and thinking about the people that really we need to support most um, and keeping in mind the social element um, to all of these discussions, not just the, the climate one is super important and not even just in our own like, you know, national or local context, but also globally as well, because there's high, high gas prices, um, you know, European countries can still, for the most part, afford to pay those prices to get that gas, but there's other countries that can't at all. Um, and again, like, you know, who is benefiting and who's who's not and who needs that support. And I think that support aspect also goes to sort of the global scale um, and thinking about how we partner with other countries as well. Um, and then, yeah, that I think, yeah, I think we can be positive, but also realistic and um, keep the pressure on. Thank you so much for those final words to all of our speakers. Um, I think you're right there on your final point, Rihanna, you know, Greens champion equality and that includes energy equality. Like we may need to make sure that everybody comes on this journey with us. I think that over the next few months and possibly years, we need to think about the power of policy at all levels, at EU, at national and at local level. I know loads of people on here are councillors, district councillors. I know that there's elections coming up next year. If you're not a councillor already, be a councillor and champion this kind of uh, content, all right? So um, people power is the second kind of power that we need to focus on because it's the best kind of power that we got. Um, and then obviously renewable power to power the people and to power the policy. So if you overwhelmed by this conversation of energy and crisis, then what Rihanna spoke about earlier, the different levels of action that you can take, like put some stuff on your windows. I think my grandma used to put tinfoil behind the radiators as well. And that like brings it back into the house. Like there's small things that everybody can do. Share your knowledge. If you've got some of these like old school tricks, then let us know. Um, let's re-nationalize everything. Let's decentralize everything and let's invest in everything that we need to invest in, which is generally everything in the UK, but, you know, also things in the EU. Um, and also tell everyone to vote. We cannot do any of these things if the Tories continue in power. So vote, vote, vote. But thank you to our wonderful speakers. Thank you to our wonderful audience, as always, for joining us in these sessions. Um, if everyone wants to put their cameras back on so we can see lovely faces, um, it's been great to get the expertise of a strong female panel. Thank you very much, guys. Um, and yeah, just thanks for joining us as always. We'll be back in November with, I think, a session on equality. Thank you, Barbara, for being in the background. Thank you, Elizabeth, as always, for organizing everything and keeping us on track. Sue for promotion and just everyone for being here. We really appreciate you. Also, if anyone feels like donating to Stroud District Green Party, I know piss strings are tight at the minute, but things cost money. And um, also I've just seen Lynn's face. Doesn't know anything. There's, a, asking me where I go on there's the an action, there's an action day. <laughs> there's an action day on in Nailsworth on Saturday to re-elect Norman and to get his newsletter out. I think I remembered that correctly. Tell me if I'm wrong. Rich, did you have something to say then and I spoke over you? No? Okay, all right. I think that was all the messages that I was supposed to give. Tell me if I've missed anything. Thank um, you, Jenny. Thank you, right. Jenny. Thank you, Jagan. Thanks, Thanks Jenny. Guys. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Super nice. Thanks all. Bye. Thanks, everyone.